Okay, everyone. So um, we're here, and we are going to cover um, almost all of 38 today, but there'll be a little bit left that we do on Tuesday. Now, I want to show you that the... Well, that's not what I wanted to show you. I don't know why that happened. Sorry about that. Okay, so... Um, do you notice here there's the homework is due Tuesday? So what I did, remember I had last time I said there was a homework here on 19, homework 19 and homework 20 here? I thought I, d I just combined them all. It's not that long, but combined it and um, have it, I wanted to do the night before, the day before the exam. So I think that'll be better for you. Now, any questions on that? Okay. So, um... Now, let's see. So that's posted, so you can do that as, do almost all of it after today's lecture. There'll just be a piece of it you can't do until um, Tuesday. I might even just do a video so you can do it earlier if you want. Okay? So now let's look at our exam schedule here. And I had hoped to have this key, I have the key ready, it's just not posted yet. So, I mean, not the key, the exam study guide and the key I should have up. So I'll have that posted later today. So you can, in the first page of it, tells you what formulas, um, what formulas you are gonna get, which is just a few of them, and what formulas you need to know, okay? So any questions before we start? You guys, I'm getting to know your faces, so that's good, I like it. Um, finally, right? So any, any questions at all about it, the exam, anything before we get going? Okay, let's go then. So now, um, I, there's one other thing on the calendar I should show you. I changed. Okay, so let's look at our calendar. I did have an R bonus assignment to do here, and I thought, well, that's not really good. You're studying for the exam. You're probably exhausted. We don't have a class here. So instead, I put the bonus survey to here. So that's what you have due on Friday. And the next Friday will be your second R bonus if you want. Okay. So to the document camera. Now, recall that, okay, so what we're doing here is the overall, when you, in multiple regression, we're doing an overall test to see if any of these slopes like for the homework or the exams here, we're trying to predict finals. This is the example we've been using from homework and exam scores to see whether there's anything in our model at all. So it's the overall test for significance. Now I just want to show you, and so here's our chi-square statistic, r squared over 1 minus r squared times n, and then we're going to do an f stat. And I just want to show you it's exactly the same as we did back when we were doing Simple regression on page 146. On page 146, we, ha we were doing the same thing when we just had one slope. See, there's the r squared, one is 1 minus r squared. And here's our f test. And we did a chi-square test right here. And this part's the same. And we either multiply, here we're multiplying by n, and here we multiplied by n minus p over p minus 1. But you might, p was just 2, right? When we were doing simple regression, you had one intercept and one slope. So you had two parameters. So this was 2 minus 1, just 1 in the denominator. So you might not have remembered that that's what it looked like. So we've already done all this. We've set up the whole structure. We did the ANOVA table. We did everything. It was before break, so um, it might be a little rusty, but it's, it's nothing new here. So you have no new formulas to remember or anything like that. You've already had this. So let's just go over it again. So we want it, we're doing, we get this in our, in our um, sample. You know, you take a sample from a larger population of 107 people, and we do get non-zero slopes, right? But we're wondering if in the population, the slopes are almost, are basically zero. So um, we're wondering how, 
And the test that we do is always this uh, assume that it was just uh, a random, just by random chance. We're, we're, we're looking at if they really, if there was really nothing in our model, which is kind of crazy in this example. Imagine homework and exams not predicting final. That would be pretty, I'd be a pretty terrible teacher and you'd be taking a lousy class. If you do all the homework and the exams, that's nothing, and then the final comes and it's like completely has, you can't predict at all how you're going to do by how well you did on the exams or how it had no connection. That would be ridiculous. So, but I'm just showing you the big, you know, how it works. Okay, so, um, but assume, you know, there, that it had nothing to do with it. That's what the null says, that crazy null. That's why we, and it says, okay, how likely, in this example, it's a crazy null. It's not always. <clears throat> but how likely would it be to get this big an R statistic if nothing was going on? This big a chi, I mean, this big an R and this big a chi-square stat. And remember, that, and we saw that that was a huge, we got a tiny, tiny, tiny p-value, right? And all we needed was 5.99 to say that our random sample landed far away from what you'd expect. Now it's landing so far away from what you'd expect. We got 66.81 right here. And I don't know if you remember, but we'd expect to get, when the null is true, you remember for the F, we'd expect to get one. And for the chi-square, we expect to get its degrees of freedom, which is two. We got so much further away from that. So the picture looked like this. Maybe I should draw it so you can really get a feel for how far away we landed. So we'll just take a quick look at our p-value calculator. So I we can figure this out. And we'll go back to the uh, PC here and look at that. So if we go to our p-value calculator, and we're looking at a chi-square distribution with two degrees of freedom here, right? We have three parameters. Um, and we have a chi-square statistic of 66. Point eight one, and let's compute our p-value here. Oh my gosh, look at it! <laughs> it's 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 almost zero. Look at the p-value. It's like it's not. It's off the charts, off the charts. And, but what, where do these other numbers come from, these critical values? Oh, here it is. How many zeros? One, oh gosh, look at that. It's essentially zero, right? That's the likelihood that if the null was true, it's, we'd see such a big chi-square statistic. Now, the numbers that you see in your chart are the critical values. So what is the chi-square? For 5%, that's what you have in your chart right there, and it turns out to be 5.991. And the next one we calculated was what you'd see for 1%. Not that we calculated, but we looked at it in the table. And then we got, whoops, I did it the wrong way. Here we go. Um, 0, 1, and we have to compute our critical value, and it's 9.21. And then we did it for 0.1%, right? And we got 13.82. So that's what, the, what it looks like. So I just want you to see that, um, let's go back to the document camera and let's draw it. I want you to realize that when you get, just get a feel for this, this is astronomically huge, which means our P is astronomically small. Really, really, really tiny. So it's tiny P almost zero percent. So in general, what are we doing? We're always comparing our test statistic. This, it's, in this case, it's a chi-squared, and we got 66.81 to some critical value to a chi-squared, and I put a star next to it to indicate that it's a critical value, right? 
And in this case, it has two degrees of freedom. It's usually put there. So um, when the null is true, this statistic, this chi-square statistic, is distributed as a chi-square curve with two degrees of freedom. Okay? And now we're, like if we check this one, if we want to compare it, we'll probably compare it, why don't we compare it to the point one? So at alpha equals 0.1%, but you usually see it as 0 0.001, that's the same thing as 0.1%, right? And we got, when we did that, 13.82. And we compare those two. And ours is so much, just let's draw the more accurate chi-square. It doesn't start to look like that till probably about four degrees of freedom with this. Or three, okay, here we go. It's like that. And um, so 13, so 5.99 was about here. And that was uh, the critical value at 5%. What does that mean? It means that this area here is 5%. All the way out there is 5%. That's what that means. So all the way out here is 5%. And then we have the 9.21, and then we have ours at about, let's just say, then we have another one. I don't know. Let's put it there. That was at 0.1%. We got a chi, a critical value of chi-squared equal to what? 13.82, that's at 1%. So there you go to one, that's 1%, that's, that's 5%, this is 1%. And ours is off the charts. We can't even put it here. It's off the charts. So what this means, and we'd expect to get around two. When the null is true, it's, you'd expect to get the m mean is uh, not the median here because it's so asymmetrical, but the mean is um, about two, our degrees of freedom. Okay, that will be in our summary, so you don't have to write that down yet. All right, so that's what it looks like. Does, does everybody understand? So what's our conclusion? It's, we're, this is just, we just, it's really rejecting the null and concluding Tremendous, I mean, we have astronomical evidence, tremendous evidence to, so we, to reject the null, which supports what common sense says, that, our, that what, at least one of those slopes is significant. Either exams, homework, or both, at least one of them, is significant is non-zero. So that's the idea, and later on in the hour, we're going to look and see how to figure out which one of them is significant. One, both, you know, we're just going to look at that. But first, before we do that, this was the chi-square test, and we have a large enough sample, it's going to be very, in very close agreement, our p-values can be very similar to what we get when we do the F test, and the only difference is going to be what? We're going to still have this R squared over 1 minus R squared, but, in, but instead of, we're going to tweak this N, N minus P, so it will be N 107 minus um, our P, which is 3. So it's going to be N minus P, which is 104, we'll multiply by 104, and divide by P minus 1, divide by 2. So basically, we're going to get, multiplying by 104 versus 107 is not going to change it much. The statistic's going to look about half as big. We'll get something about 33. Okay? Let's look and see if we do. All right. So now, we're going to get the same p-value, very close to the same p-value. All right. The F-test is usually done using ANOVA. And we're going to do that next, but it's easiest to think of it as a slight adjustment of the chi-square. Okay. 
Remember, the f has the same relation to chi-square, has an analogous relation to chi-square, as the t does to the z. When you get large enough samples, they're going to be, they're going to look the same. So how are the f and chi-square related? Well, the key part of both is this r-square, which measures the strength of your model, over the 1 minus r-square, which measures the strength of the errors. So that's the relationship. When the nose, okay, so that's the idea. And um, the chi-square curves are pretty much based, are the, based on the normal curves. They're the um, sum of squared z-scores. So chi-square is sum of squared z-scores. And the f-curves are, are sort of analogously based on the t-curves. You saw that with one degree of freedom, t-squared was f, the same as f, and um, z-squared was the same as chi-squared. All right, so the F test gives you slightly more precision. Let's write that down. I mean, it's underlined. So you remember the P value is always going to be just slightly larger. Maybe it's undetectably larger, but slightly larger. And so you need more evidence to reject the null, but the difference is negligible with large samples. So let's look how the two stats are related. So you see, basically, you have the strength of the model, and then you have the strength, then you have the errors, sort of the average errors. There's n points, and so you're dividing by n there. And that, when you simplify, that's in the numerator. Now what are you doing here? Here you have the model, and here's how many parameters you have in the model, minus the intercept, because we don't really care about that, right? And here is 1 minus r squared times divided by that tweaked n. Remember? n minus p. It's all, it's, it's because we don't, we're not, we don't know. It takes into account we don't know the standard deviations of, the, of all the variables. And there's, okay, so that's the idea. And so then it looks like this. So the difference is right here. All right, okay, now let's compute our F. It's the same thing we did. So I think if you understand the structure, you're not going to, you're going to need to do this on the exam. So I want to, um, it's really not too hard. Just Remember, it's r squared over 1 minus r squared, so it's 0 0.2 squared over r squared over, you know, over 1 minus 0 0.62 squared. That part's the same. And then, instead of just multiplying by 1, this is what you did when you did the chi-square, right? You can start there. That's the chi-square. Just multiply by n. That's the simplest one to remember. Then, okay, this is n. You ask, Remember that degrees of freedom are n minus p. So it's n minus the number of parameters. And how do you know what the number of parameters is? It was from the previous page. We had a model that had, it's, we had an intercept and two, two slopes. So there's three parameters. That's what we had. This was homework. And this was exams. And that's the intercept. So there's three parameters. Okay. Remember that. That was from the previous page. And so now we have, um, so we have n minus 3 and 3 minus 1. Okay? And we said we'd get something about, look, we multiplied it by 104 before and got 66, right? This, this is what's going to make it look really different. So we get, what did, when I did it, I got 32.4, approximately. Okay. Now, um, maybe it's 32.47. I think that's what it was. Okay, so how many degrees of freedom in the numerator? Well, the degrees of freedom, look, look here. These are the degrees of freedom before we simplify it. This is the degrees of freedom for the numerator. I know it ends up in the denominator, <laughs> right? But it's the degrees of freedom for the numerator. And this is the degrees of freedom for the denominator. Okay? So we have, so the degrees of freedom, this is always p minus 1. So in this case, it's equal to 3 minus 1. 
and this is always n minus p, so in this case it's 107 minus 3. So that's 4. So that's what we've got. Okay? Any questions so far? All right. Now, so it makes it really easier to understand, I mean to memorize it. And memorizing, I like to memorize it in a way that makes sense, that creates a structure so you understand it better. So when you, okay, so now find the critical value for F at the 5% significance level using the chart below. Good. So we've got a chart here, like, you, you know, I'll give you on the exam because you don't have a computer you can use, so you're going to have to use charts. All right, so where should you look on here? So this is, for the F, since you have two sets of degrees of freedom, we've looked at this before, it's kind of more complicated, so you have to have a different chart for each significance level. So unlike the chi-square, we only have one set of degrees of freedom. So I could just put them all on one chart. So this is only for p equals 5%. I didn't, on this chart. So we're only finding the critical value. So what do you do? Okay, so you go down here. This is two degrees of freedom in the numerator. And across, why did I choose the 60 here? Well, it's actually between these two, right? because we have degrees of freedom, 104. So that is right, excuse me, between these two, 104. But generally people, look, ours is 30. So what are we doing? We are comparing our F stat, compare our F stat equal to 32.47, wow, that's huge, to what? And we're comparing that to the F critical, and there, it's going to be so much, people usually choose the smaller one, if it's between two to be more conservative, they choose the smaller one. The smaller degrees of freedom, I should write that. I'll write it here. If um, your degrees of freedom is between two lines, choose line with smaller degrees of freedom. That means you basically have a smaller sample size and you're being more conservative. So that's why we're choosing the 60. Okay? So it means you have to, here it means you have to have a bigger F, but it's Okay, so compare it to this one, and so that's the one with two degrees of num numerator. We really should be comparing it to this, but it's an estimate of it. So we'll use, if we had a uh, p-value calculator, you really want to compare it to, because our F stat is, but we're going to use this. Does that make sense to everyone? Is that okay? Okay, we'll just use the smaller one. It's more conservative because people like to be conservative. It's, they don't want to be boastful, saying, hey, I got a bigger P, you know, smaller p-value than I did. I got a bigger f-stat. So because it's more conservative. So if you see it between, just choose the smaller one. And let's compare it. It's way bigger. It's so much bigger. This is at alpha equals 5%. All right, so that means, so our p-value is less than, it's way less than, because this is way bigger, way bigger, so our p-value is way less than 5%. Okay? And you should have known that because remember, note, when h not is true, and we're assuming it's true, we'd expect the mean f stat is approximately 1. It's very, it's very close to 1. And we got such a huge one. All right. We're so much bigger. 
this is so much bigger than one. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? Is it ringing a bell? Do you remember we did all this before? Do you remember? This isn't anything new. All right, now let's go on. And um, here we are. You might wonder why the F stats. Let's just look at the F stats, OK? And understand why they look different. All right, so here's what we've looked at before. And um, you can look for more explanation in the appendix. But here's the basic idea. They have different numerators and denominators. Why? Let's remember why. The denominators we've talked about a lot. Um, remember that the F stat, just like the T stat, is the statistic we use when we have normal distributions. We assume normality with the T, and we're doing it, but don't know the standard deviations of each variable and have to estimate them from the sample SDs. So we make these two adjustments, right? We make the SDs a little larger by using SD plus, right? That's the first thing we do. So we get that. Then we square the SDs to get the variances. So this is the difference right here. So we're putting in 104 in this example instead of 107. For the, you know, we're multiplying by 104 instead of 107. So that's the difference in the denominators right here. That's the n minus p difference that then appears up here. OK? And then the second difference is we use the f curve, and this is instead of the chi-square curves. And unlike the chi-square curves, there's a different f curve for each degrees of freedom in the denominator, for each difference in sample size. And the f curves have fatter tails. So you need more evidence, just like the t's. So f and t, like fat, right? Think f a t, f and t, have fatter tails than what? Chi squared. And what do you think? T corresponds to Z. That means, so, fatter tails, tails, the area of the tails is your p-value. So, F and T have bigger p-values. than their corresponding chi-squared and c. But that difference becomes negligible. But the st statistic looks very different. So that explains the denominators. And that's, that's the same thing we did with the t. But what about the numerators? Why are they so different? Why, you know, the chi-square stat has a numerator. Look at this. You see, here we multiplied by, here we're dividing by p minus 1. That's p minus 1 times the f stat. We just saw that. We just saw that our chi squared was twice as big. It was 60 instead of 32.47. It was just about twice as big. It was 66.81. Not exactly, because there's that little, we multiplied by 107 in one and 104 in the other. But that's a big difference. But it doesn't, it's just, OK, why? The difference in the numerators is conceptually meaningless. So it's very confusing to people because most people think they're very different distributions because, you know, they don't, you don't get the same statistic, not even close. You get, depending on the number of parameters, one is, you know, look, they look a lot different. It's just, and it's just due to a historical accident, really, of who decided to name, who decided what names to write down. It's kind of crazy. But this is true. So Fisher, this is, what I like that what he did. Fisher decided it would be nice to divide the numerator by the degrees of freedom in the F-test, since it makes typical values, stat values, about one when the null is true, regardless of the number of degrees of freedom. And that's super nice. That's like with the, nor with the T and the um, Z. You can ask, you know, you know when the null is true, you're going to get a statistic around 0. So now when the null is true using F, you get a statistic around 1. 
And that makes a lot of sense, because when the null is true, you're thinking of it's basically, remember we talked about this? The, the new, there's no model. It's all noise. So then why should the ratio of the you know, strength of the model to the strength of the noise, it, it's all noise. So uh, that's what the null says. So you get a ratio of one. And he made it look that way. But Pearson, who discovered the chi-square distribution, decided not to divide by the degrees of freedom. He just decided not to. So the chi-square stats typical values when the null is true is the number of degrees of freedom. That's just it. So the difference between the chi is completely analogous to the difference between the z and the t. With large n, they're the same. It's just a change of scale. The meaning is the same. You'll get the same p-values. Okay, so, all right. So that's, this is, this is what, it's not quite one, but it's almost one. And um, when the null is true, the mean of the F stat is one, think, remember, think, and the mean of the chi-square is its degrees of freedom. So this, you don't remember, just, it's about one. It's one, basically, just think of it that way. Okay, so when our statistics are much bigger than that, you should know to reject the null. That, is, that means that our random, their sample, just by random chance is what it means. That's what the p-value means. That if you're assuming it's just a random sample, it's the probability that it, would, that it landed so far away from what you'd expect. That's the idea. I mean, it could land that far away, but it's such a tiny probability, and that's what the p-values mean. Okay, so we reject that. And then, of course, you can do it by the, um, here, you can also do the F test by, using, by setting up an ANOVA table, like we did before, doing all this. But remember, um, it would be, if you're given R, it's, it's very simple to do this, right? So if you're given R, it's extremely simple to do this. We might as well do this. Um, so first, if you're given all this, so here, first let's get this SST here. All right? So how are we going to get it? Okay, just for a Okay, so what are we doing? So you know that SST is equal to what? SSM plus SSE, right? And this, we're basically dividing it into two parts. The part that we, we're dividing the total variability of the y's into two parts. And we say that this part, the model, is r squared times SST. And the error part is 1 minus r squared times SST. That's what we're doing. OK? So basically, when we're doing computing this, so first, let's get the SST. So how can we get the SST? We're given the standard deviation here, and we're given n. So do you remember that the standard deviation is just the square root of SST, the sum of squares total, over n? So we have that SST is just equal to n times, well, it's right there, SDY squared. Okay, so let's do that. N is what? 107 times SD squared, 10.27 squared. And that is equal to 11,285.6. Okay, so we've got that. Now we divide it up. So what's r squared? OK, so we have r right here. I'm just going to, so that's, I'm just going to round it to 0 0.62 squared. So we're going to take that times 11,285.6. And this part, so we're dividing that 11,250.6 into two parts. One is r squared. That's our mod, SS model, and the other one is 1 minus r squared times our total. Okay? And that's what we're going to put here and here. 
So I did that, and I got, for this one, I got 4,338.18, and this one I got, well, you could just subtract, you could just subtract it from there, um, or you could multiply it out. You could just, probably easiest to just, once you get that, subtract it, but you might want to check to just make sure you didn't make a careless mistake. They have to add up to that. So let's fill those in. So here we go. Here it's 4338.18, and this is 6947.42. And just so you remember, this is SST, and this is R, squ R squared, and 1 minus R squared add up to 1, right? So R squared times SST, and 1 minus, sorry, I should put it right here. 1 minus r squared times sst, add up to sst. All right, now we need our degrees of freedom. Okay, so where is our model? Our model's right here. So do you see it has three parameters? One, two, three. Three b's that we're estimating, betas that we're estimating in the population with these b's. So p equals 3, and the degrees of freedom here Remember, this is p minus 1, this is n minus p, and it has to add up to n minus 1. Okay? So, we have 2 here. We have what here? 104. And we have 106. And then, to get this, what are we going to do? The mean square. Remember how we did this? You just divide. You divide four, this by 2 to get the mean square. And I got, we did this many times before. So you just divide that by 2 and you divide, maybe it looks better if I do that. You can see it better. So we're just taking this and dividing it by 104 here. All right, so do that and I got 66.8. All right, and now this F statistic is just this one divided by that one. So what's that? That divided by, I should write it here. Well, no, why? Well, I will, just so you make sure you got it. And that was 32.4. It's exactly what we got before. Actually, it must have been 32.4, not 4. I wasn't, when I was reading my handwriting, I couldn't tell whether it was a 4, 1, or 4, 7, but it must be a four. It's got to be the same thing. Why does it have to be the same thing? Look, look what we just did. It's exactly the same thing because what are we doing here? We're saying, okay, so f is equal to, what we did was we just, okay, f is equal to the mean square model over the mean square error, right? That's what this is, th that over that. So what's the mean square model? It's r squared times sst Divided by what? What did we do? Divided by p minus 1. And this is 1 minus r squared times sst divided by n minus p. Right? So this simplifies. The sts cancel out. And we get r squared, you know, r squared over 1 minus r squared, and then you simplify, and it's times n minus p over p minus 1. So that's why you have to get the same exact thing if you did it using r squared. If you did it like a harder way with rounding error, you might get something slightly different, but it's the same thing. Okay, that's pretty much it. So now, what are we going to do? Uh, one thing I should alert you to is that we are going to be using extensive, like really soon, something, we're going to be using the square root of this. So, and that's called the standard, we're going to be, remember the standard, we've done it many times, so the square root of the mean square error is SD plus for the errors. You see? We're taking the sum of squares and multiplying by n minus p, so it's sd plus instead of sd errors. 
All right. Remember the square? Do you remember the square root of 1 minus r squared times the standard deviation of the y is sd errors? So we've got that, so let's just write it in. So the square root of 66.8 is what we want for the sd plus errors. All right. I think there's one like this on your homework. And certainly you'll have to do this on the exam. So we're done with that now. So all summary, 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 summary. Um, this is just some practice here. Should we do it now? Would you like to do it now? You might as well while you're in the groove or not. Might as well just do it now. Okay. So, I mean, this is explanation here. Mm, let's just remember it. Okay, our unifying theme, separating signal from noise. R squared, this is a fraction of the... Okay, R squared measures the strength of the model. 1 minus R squared measures the strength of the errors. So we've got that and that. All right. They're the test statistics we use to find p-values to answer our, the question. What question? Is our sample signal big enough to reflect a real simple signal in the population, or is it just due to sampling variation? Okay. That's all it's doing. It's a measure of how far, assuming it was a ran, just by random chance, how far it landed from what we'd expect. And if it lands too far, we say there must be a signal in there. Can't all be noise. Our model must include our si our model must include a little signal or a big signal. Okay. Notice the bigger n is, the bigger your test statistic. That's why it's really nice to remember it this way. N is in the numerator. Why? So why, I mean, like when you simplify it. The bigger your sample, the bigger your test statistic. That makes sense because, let's just do it so this one. That makes sense. Since the bigger your sample size, the better you'll be able to detect a real signal in the population. If you have a tiny little sig sample size, you might not detect it. But if you have the bigger your sample size, the more likely you are to detect a real signal if it's there in the population. If you had data on the whole population, you could detect any signal, no matter how small it was. All right. So let's do our example here. And what are we doing? Okay, so this is just sort of just the bare bones of it. Okay. I need a highlighter. I ran out of... I guess I don't have one. Okay. So, um, let's say you're just given this model. This, this is just our model. So what is it that, that um, okay, so this is what we think is going on, and we're, our null is what? Our null is that all these betas, are, all these slopes are zero. Okay. And so how many parameters do we have? So we have one, two, three, four parameters, right? That is just an error term. That's not a parameter. Okay, so p equals 4. And what else do we need to know? n equals 1 and r equals 0.1. So now we can, those are the only things we need to know to compute both either the f or the chi-square. That's all we need to know. So here, let's do the, let's um, compute r squared and 1 minus r squared. This is such an easy example. So r squared is just going to be that squared, so it's 0 0.01, and 1 minus r squared then has to be 0 0.99, okay? So now, for the chi-square, how many degrees of freedom? So the degrees of freedom for the chi-square, what is it? That's just p minus 1, okay? So that's equal to 3, because we have 4 minus 1, so we have 3 degrees of freedom. For the chi-square, you only have one set of degrees of freedom. However many slopes you have is your degrees of freedom for the chi-square. All right, now, oh, compute the chi-square. That's easy. You should know it without even, like, watching. Just think. Write something down. See if you can get, without even looking, just write down what you think it would be. Without looking at anything. You should know this right now before I write it down. 
Okay, so you should just think, okay, for all, for both of them, I'm just going to do r squared over 1 minus r squared. That's a given. Now, the chi squared is super easy. You just multiply by n. That's it. We're, now we'll just fill in the numbers. So we have 0 0.01 over 0 0.99 times um, n, which is 100. So I got 1.01. All right? There. Now, remember, we'd expect it to be about 3. So it has to be quite a bit larger than when the null is true. That's the mean. Look how much smaller. So this, we are not going to reject the null. And if we looked at um, the critical value, let's see, what about the chi-square table? Oh, it only goes up to 24 here. But I, you can look on the calculator, and I got a p-value of approximately 80%. That's astronomical. You cannot reject the null. Now, how about the f? So for the f, what are we going to do? How many degrees of freedom? Well, it's going to have degrees of freedom in the numerator is p minus 1, which is the same as here. So that's pretty easy. And the degrees of freedom in the denominator is n minus p. So in this case, what do we have? n is 100 minus 4, so it's 96. OK? So now we're going to do the same thing. Do I have room here? Maybe. What are we going to do? I'm just going to start with that same 0 0.1. This part's the same, over 0 0.99. And then I'm going to multiply by, instead of multiplying by 100, I multiply by 96. Now, that would make it look very similar to this, just a little bit smaller. But we have to divide by that, what? By 3. And that's what's going to make our F statistic look just about one third of that. We should get about 0.3 something. And I got 0 0.323. And the p-value is very similar. So it looks really different, but that's just because this one is centered at 1. So you, should, you, know, you compare this one to 1, you compare this one to 3. This one is centered at 3. It's just that factor that, uh, just to confuse us students, right? So that's it. Any questions on that? Here's another example, somewhat different, actually not really. Um, do you want to do one more? Really, this is one where the numbers work out really easy, and I think sometimes it's good to do made-up examples. So what's this one? All right, so now you should be at, what do we need to know? Just n SDY, and boy, R squared is already given to you. Okay, that's what was. So, what do we have to get? The SS total. So, our SS total is just going to be N times SDY squared. So, that's what? 35 times what's SDY? Oh, times 10 squared. So, that's really easy. I put that there. And here's our I squared, one quarter. So that means that one quarter, point two, one quarter, multiply this. This is R squared times SST, and this is one minus R squared times SST. So you say one quarter of 3,500 here, and three quarters of 3,500. Okay, so that's what we have there. So this is 875, and so that is 2625. Now our degrees of freedom, n minus 1, that's 34. Here's p minus 1, so that is, what is p? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Don't count the error. Okay, that's 
All right, just, that's 5. So P is equal to 5. So that's 5 minus 1, which is 4. And this is N minus P, which is 30. So it adds up. Okay. And then, what do we do? 875 divided by 4 is... 218.75 and 26.25 divided by 30 is 87.5. And then when you divide these two, that, that is your F ratio, and that's 2.5. And this SD plus errors is the square root of 87.5. All right. I think we're done here. So we have to compare what we want to do to see if we want to know what our conclusion, if we want to do it at some significance level, we compare RF equal to 2.5 to what? We're going to compare it to F star, the critical value, with 4 and 30, 4 in the numerator, 4 and 30 degrees of freedom. Let's see if that's on our table. It is. Good. I think this was like taken from an exam. This is typical of an exam because here it is right on the table. So we go 4 and 30 and we find it right there. 2.69. See, 4 degrees. Sorry about that. Go 4, and here's 30. And 4. And where they intersect, there you got it. And that's at 5%. See, it says right here. All right, so let's write that down. So that's 2.69. at 5%. All right, and how do they compare? It's less. Whoa, what does that mean? Remember the picture. Less. Okay, so our picture, draw a little picture here, is going to look like what? It'll look something like, it's always positive, remember? It's pretty close. It's still going to be asymmetrical. I'm sorry, I didn't draw it very asymmetrical. But it's all positive. This is our F. And right here is our critical value. And it's 2.69. This is 5%. And we didn't get beyond that. We're right here. 2.5. So that means that this is more than 5%. Our p-value is more than 5%. It's about 6.5% or something. It's pretty close. That doesn't, but if you have, want to go by that strict cutoff, I would, you know, the people do. I don't really think, I think it's important to report the p-value, but it, on an exam, if we went by, let's say, can you reject it 5%? No. So, R is this last, so p-value is greater than 5%, cannot reject the null. What does that mean? It means that we can't conclude that any of those slopes are significant. They could all be zero. Okay, any questions on that? All right, let's see. So now we're just going to say, I think we got that down pretty well. And now we're going to just begin this chapter. And these are, once we find that at least one of the slopes is significant, once we find that at least one of the slopes is significant, we can do a Z or T test on the individual slopes. 
Now remember, these aren't the same slopes as in the simple regressions. These multiple regression slopes, we talked about this a lot, are the partial slopes because they're the slopes that explain the part of y that's left after the other x's in the model have already done their part in predicting y. So how much extra predictor value can you get once you've already put the, all the other x's in the model? So the slopes in the full model are each only contributing their separate part. Whereas in the simple regression, the slope for x includes the effect of all the other variables that are both correlated with it and with the response variable. So it's, it puts all that effect together. And that's multiple regression separates it out. So here's a good way to think of it. Think of it this way. The size of your left foot is a good predictor of your height. But if your right foot is already in the model, predicting height, your left foot won't add any extra predictive value. And in fact, it messes things up. So if two variables are highly correlated, don't put them in the model. OK. Now, we can use z and t tests for the individual slopes in our mo multiple regression model, the same way we did for simple regression. Remember, we can't use z or d tests for the collective effect of the multiple slopes. So we couldn't, the first step is to test the whole model to see if there's anything there. Then once you find significance, your next step is to see which of those slopes are significant. And you use z and t tests to do that. OK? So let's look at this. So the f test and the chi-square 2 told us that at least one slope, maybe both, maybe both the homework and the exams, or maybe just one or the other, are significant. Which one? Maybe both. Let's test them. So how are we going to test them? OK. And the chi-square 2, let's do the, the z first, because it's simpler. And then we'll do the um, t. So the z is just our observed slope minus our expected slope over the standard error, the way it always is. But it's too tedious to compute the standard errors when they're multiple x's. It's just, so you're not going to have to do that. You just have to, it's just ugh, so tedious. So we'll let software do it for us, OK? So here we're letting software do it for us, right here. So what are we doing here? So we're, first of all, what is h not? Let's put that somewhere because we're getting these p-values, so what is it? So h not here is that we're going to do it, let's do it just for homework. That's what we're testing. So we'll call it um, the homework slope, but in the model, it's beta 1. We put, just put homework first here. OK, beta 1 is equal to 0 in the model. And the alternative is, um, do you want to do a two-tailed test or a one-tailed? It's probably more likely to do a one-tailed. Let's just do a two-tailed two test for now, because most printouts do two-tailed tests. That beta 1 is not equal to 0. This is saying that it could hurt people. Gosh, <laughs> it could hurt or help. That's kind of crazy, but we'll just do that. So now, what are we doing? So now we're going to get our z statistic here, calculate z. Well, this is super easy. It's our observed slope right there. That's what we observed. So it's equal to 0 0.1641 minus our expected under the model, the null is true, over the standard error. And it's given to you right here. This isn't the standard error. This is just the standard error. That's all it is. And it's 2.27. OK, so two, so you know what this looks like. This is just a z, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, 1, 2, 3 as a z-score, as a slope. We're testing this b1 here slope. Um, we got what? We got 2.27 as a z-score 
z equals 2.27, and as a slope, it, it was just 0 0.1641. So, well, what does that mean? We'd look up the middle area. I think you know how to do this. Between z equals positive and negative value. And I got 97.7%. And so then each one is 1.15%. So we could have done a one-tailed test, in which case we'd have more significance. It would be this little, 1.15%. Or if we do a two-tailed test, our p-value is going to be twice that. So p is equal to 100 minus 97.7 over 2. No, not over 2. Just that. We're doing both test sides. So it's equal to 2.3. And that's what you put in here. So we reject null. And conclude homework slope is significant, is not equal to zero in the population. It's significant. Okay, um, it's not equal to zero. Sorry. Homework slope is not equal to zero in the population. What's the way to say that? The beta one is not equal to zero. That's the way to say it. Okay, now, because um, that means in the population. And if we did a one-sided, we'd have even more strong evidence. That's why a lot of people want you to do the two-sided journals and stuff, because if you, if you reject with the two-sided, you're certainly going to reject with half the p-value. So any questions on that? Okay, now we can do the same thing with the T. So we might as well. Wait a minute, we might be able to finish the whole thing. Let's see. So we do the same thing with the T. What are we doing here? Okay. So now, again, we could have just looked. Okay, so here we're just going to say, what's the difference? We're just going to use SE+, plus, which is just a tweak version of the SE. Right? It's just a little bit bigger. And um, so here we have it, SE plus. Okay, SE plus, so we're going to fill this in right here. So you can just look here and see you have three parameters, beta 0, beta 1, and beta 2. So this is P equals 3. All right. And that's why you have 104 degrees of freedom here. It's 107 minus 3. Okay. Now, all right, so here, what do we do? Um, we're going to just, we're going to do the same thing. We'll just say T is equal to your observed slope, 1.6. Oh, calculate T. It's right here. Duh. So we get 0 0.1641 minus 0. That's what we expect. Over the standard error. This is super easy. And we get 2.24 right there. And now the degrees of freedom. How did we get? Why is this 104 degrees of freedom? You'd think, hmm. Because, okay, we take into account all the points. So it's exactly the same degrees of freedom as in the F-test. The T-test for individual slopes in the multiple regression take into account all the other parameters in the model. So you need to adjust the degrees of freedom accordingly. You don't just do N minus 1 like we did with, you know, or N minus 2. You have to take into account all of them. All right, because um, that's how we computed the errors based on 
we computed that slope based on all the parameters being in the model. So you have to do n minus the total parameters in the model. So when we just had two parameters for sing simple regression, we did n minus 2. So remember, now it's n minus 3. If we had four parameters, it would be n minus 4. So that's really the only difference. Okay? All right. Now, what do we have to do? So when you look, so you have to look at a t-curve when you're doing this. You have to look at a t-curve with 104 degrees of freedom to find this out. So let's do that. One, two, three. We don't, two, negative three, zero. And we want to see where to place that 2.24. We have to look at this. I'll show you. We, we can't do it on our t-table, so let's do it on the calculator here. And we'll go to this, to the t distribution. And you have to put in, uh, take into account all the parameters in the model. So it's 107 minus 104 and minus p. And now we have, what do we have? 2.24. OK. And then we want to do what? Right tail, left tail? Why don't we do two tails? Because we're going to do it. That's what we did for the other one. So compute the p-value. So it's 0 0.227. I mean, 2.7%. 2.7%. OK. So if we do one tail, we just did the right tail, we get 0 0.136. Okay. Well, let's do it. Okay, so we'll draw the picture. And we have 2.24 here. And that's where um, 0 0.1641 falls here. You get 2.2. And negative 2.24, and we said what? That we get 1. Point, was this like 2.7? I think it was 2%, so you get 1.36 and 1.36%. So our p-value is bigger, 2.7 instead of 2.3, yes, because t has fatter tails. All right, now what about confidence intervals? Hmm, let's do that. We probably won't finish this chapter. I'm going to leave. I'll leave the last two pages because I'm getting tired. How about you guys? Oh, you know, it's this, like, when you look at all these little, all right, confidence intervals. Let's do that. Remember, there, if the, what did we get here? Are we rejecting the null or not rejecting the null? Yes, we're rejecting the null here because this is, so that means our confidence, our 5% confidence interval will not include zero. And it doesn't. See how the, for homework, it doesn't include zero. Right? And it doesn't using z either. Good. It agrees. So what are we doing here? For confidence intervals for individual slopes using the t. So what is this number here? Here's we have the same thing. We have the same standard error. What's going on here? What are we doing? Remember what a 95% confidence interval is. It's going to be a 95%, let's do it with the z first, it's easier. 95% confidence interval is going to be equal to our test statistic, which is 0 0.1641 plus or minus, we usually do 2, but this 1.96 is a little more exact. This is the critical value, and this is the critical value. Let me show you, and then we'll do it. So let's go over to the computer. 
So now we're on the Z and the T. We'll do the Z first, normal distribution. And what do we want to do? We want to find out what the Z score is for um, 5% for two tails, right? Confidence interval is always equivalent to two tails. This is 95% in the middle, right? And because, and so that we've been rounding to two. Now let's do the same thing for the T. So it depends on our degrees of freedom. So we have 104 degrees of freedom here. And we want to get a p-value of 0 0.5. We want the two, what, 95 percent in the middle. We could have put 95 in the middle. It's the same thing. We did two tails. We could have put 90. I wanted to compute that. Sorry. It's jumped around on me. OK, 0, 0 0.5. And I want to compute the t. So it's 1.983. It's bigger. You could have just said the middle area of 95%. That's more direct for a confidence interval of 95%. And now we want to compute T. You get the same thing, 1.983. And that's the critical value there. OK, so let's go back to the document camera. And it corresponds to the two-sided test, which we've been doing. So this is T star. Put a little star in there. 95% confidence intervals. All right, so 9 is plus or minus. We're going to use the 1.96 times our standard error, which is what? Our standard error is this. And that's where you get this right here. That's the same thing as that, if you did it out. And here, Using the T, it would be the same thing, plus or minus the critical value. It's a little bit bigger here. And then times also a little bit bigger standard error. So you can see. And then we should say, does it agree? Yes. Why? Because our 95% confidence intervals do not include zero. That's the same, remember, as reject, same as rejecting the null that beta is equal to zero for a two-sided test, because it has 95% in the middle, a two-sided test. Add. Right? So I didn't, I should show you it's the same. Draw the picture. Okay, let's draw the picture. Okay, so here we have a zero. And what are we saying? That 95% in the middle corresponds to this critical value right here of negative 1.983 and positive 1.983. And so for our t-curve here, we landed beyond that. So we have, and this is 2.5. This is going to be less than 95% in the middle. This is 2.5% in each tail. All right, and this right here would be what? 97 point, where, what is that? 72.38% in the middle. So you see how that's why it's the same thing. Because it landed our confidence interval. You see, we have a confidence interval that's outside that range. We landed over here. Or over here, actually. Okay, so that's the idea. And this one is 95%. And we have 
We usually do two, but it's a tiny bit smaller. It's negative 1.96 and 1.96. Okay, next time we'll start right here. So you, this is the part of the homework you'll have to wait. And we'll just do this little bit. And then we'll have a review on Tuesday. And I'll send you a, wait, you know, study guide advice, and I'll post the key. I, and not the key, this, what are you going to get? You're going to get, like, a list of formulas that you need to know and need to, you know, all that stuff. And ones you'll be given, very limited amount that you'll be given. And um, a study guide and the key. And I'll post that today. And then a practice exam I have to make up that I'll give to you soon. Okay? Any questions? And there's office hours today. No, not, not today. Friday. And also I'll have office hours Monday and Tuesday. But not on Wednesday. Okay, that's it. Bye.